My name is Naim Zafar. I'm, a, I'm from Lahore, but I've been living in uh, Silicon Valley for the last 30 years. So I, I am a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley and Northeastern. So this is about sort of giving you some background how to be investor ready, especially many of you are going to Saudi Arabia soon. So just to give you a little bit of my own background, uh, I was an electrical engineer by training, went to Brown University of Minnesota, started working for a large company. Then I started my first company age 26, quick turn went uh, public. We invented hardware emulation technology. If you have an iPhone with a fingerprint sensor or a Mac, we invented that. Company was ready to come. Apple bought that company. Then I ran a company, uh, in Pixis and Silicon Design System in chip design space. Started teaching at Berkeley 18 years ago and started another company, Bits and Mobile, which was acquired by Oracle. And then I started another company called Telesense in Agriculture, which was acquired by UPL. Also started teaching at Northeastern uh, seven years ago, and also teaching at uh, History and Geopolitics at Santa Clara. So I wrote a few books, and these are all dealing with how to start a company, how to build a company, how to run a company. Because I've done seven startups, five-time CEO. I have uh, invested in and on the board of 22 companies. So anything about raising money, talking to investors, I'm the guy. So be happy to give you any questions, any answer any questions you have. Uh, obviously, I've prepared some slides, and uh, this is sort of my uh, five-topic uh, agenda, because I know many of you are going to uh, Saudi Arabia, and my what I was talking to Fad was, these are the five topics I'm hoping to cover today. How do you get maximize your chance getting funding? How do you talk about your startups in a way that you'll be heard, understanding how investors invest and think? and looking at the mechanics and what happens post-funding. So this is the five topics I wanted to cover at high speed, but obviously we can take the direction any other way. And Rebecca is back, who is our host, so I'll hand this back to Rebecca, how she wants to run this, but this I have slides ready for these five topics. And Rebecca has not unmuted herself, so I'm gonna wait. Hard to hear you unless you unmute yourself. Don't, cannot mute, cannot talk, got it. Then stay there, I'll, I'll do the rest. Okay. Uh, we cannot, yeah, she I, cannot I, hear I, us. I, can, I, I couldn't unmute myself, so I, I didn't have the ability to unmute myself. So uh, name, a uh, pleasure to meet you online and uh, thanks everyone for uh, being patient for my uh, Wi-Fi outage. I'm currently in Islamabad and sometimes things in Pakistan don't go as you plan. It, just, it is what it is. Uh, so um, basically, uh, I, um, I'm i really excited for this um, webinar uh, name simply because uh, we had just uh, finished raising last summer. And um, as you all know, the pack launch event to KSA is coming up soon. And I'm super excited to learn what you have uh, ready to present. So just to uh, give you guys a, a little bit about myself, my name is Rebecca Sabaleta. I'm CEO and co-founder of PESMO, a modern HR tech platform where we streamline automate people functions for small and medium-sized businesses starting in Pakistan. And uh, name, I believe you just gave you your own introduction, so I won't do that over again. Uh, so in the way that this uh, this is going to work out is that um, after the introductions, Name will be presenting his slides where uh, I will then have some Q&A for about 10 minutes and then we will open up a Q&A to the floor for another 10 to 15 minutes. So with that, I will pass it back to Name. Thank you. So let's start with the first topic. How do you get ready to seek funding? The short answer is investors, is a typical investor, whether it's a venture capitalist or an angel investor, they listen to dozens of presentations every week. Everybody who's trying to pull on their coat tag, so you have to be ready to get their attention. You have to be a storyteller. All entrepreneurs are storytellers. You don't have to build the product or minimum viable product to see funding. You need to build a story. 
story is has to be captivating. Suppose you were a somebody who wanted to make a movie. You're pitching to in Hollywood to producers. You haven't made the movie, but you're telling a story which is like so compelling. They say, yeah, if you did this, I can see these people want to see this. This is your job. You, many people, many entrepreneurs confuse when they talk to investors, they're trying to sell their product. It's not the customer presentation, guys. You're selling an ownership in your company to investors. This is your product, not what you make. So you have to tell a story which sounds something like this, that we saw a problem because of our unique background, because of family accident, because of I ran into something, I saw a unique insight. And then I developed a thesis, then I went and validated it by talking to dozens of actual potential customers. I knew exactly what will delight them. I assembled a team. I know exactly who my customers are. I know who my competition is. So I have that clarity. What I need from you is this money so I can go to this milestone by this date. This is the story. Every startup has to tell this story. If you should be able to get the story quickly, efficiently, usually in less than a minute, that's what gets you noticed. So you wanna be the memorable one. So to be investor ready, don't approach the investors unless you have a strong vision. Where are you going to company? How are you trying to change things that, as they exist today? And how do you know people really want this? That's the traction part. Then you have the right players already ready to go or in place as co-founders. You know exactly who needs you more and you know your key metrics. Because when they start talking about customer acquisition cost, then you lost them already. So these are the things you may not even have them, but you can estimate you have put a stake in the ground. So this is a story you're telling with those facts. So the way you do that is to be investor ready. You need to create a one pager. The one pager is a short subset of your full investor presentation. It is just enough to intrigue them so they want to meet with you. So this one pager, even if you go to a list, KSA and there are many people, you may have a one pager ready from your pocket and say, look, let me, let's meet, a, but this give you summary of what we do. So one pager, sometimes you're meeting in a coffee shop. You want to be able to put this one pager and tell the whole story by looking at this thing. So what is it? This is simple subset. We saw a problem. We saw the alternative people have. Alternative have shortcoming. So we came up with a way to do it better. We know how to make money. We know who are we going after. We have the right people in place. We have some proof people really want this. And what do we need from you? This is, could be told in one page. You think that's too much. I cannot get this on page. Let me show you some example. All you have to do is Google. I just Google example of good executive summary. All kinds of interesting things come up. This is free. Just copy them. Sequoia tells you on their website what they need to see. So you don't have to wonder, this is an example of one page. This is the top half of the page. That's the bottom half of the page. One page is what Organize a biotech diagnostic company. This novel test changed the way kidney diseases are diagnosed today. In a sentence, mein, I know what they do. It's a test for kidney. Then you read the rest, the lots of numbers here. How many million patients of kidney failure? Today, there are two products, two kind of tests. The market is big. This is a team, is, uh, this is a women team, Dr. Isha Abdullah, Dr. Mini Sarwal, they're at Stanford. What have they done so far? Simple one page. This executive summary allowed them to get $1.5 million from angel investor. Two years later, company was acquired for 30 million. So it's not, is this possible? In one page, you can do this. So just telling the story with some key numbers, to the point, with numbers, with clarity. First line of us, like, what are you Here's another example. Executive summary, technology to do mobile market, selected by a Fortune 50 company. So they know already, that, okay, this product is big, Fortune 50 company is 
only vendors supporting single sign-on, blah, blah. Opportunity, market is big. That's what the product does. That's what the team is. One pager. So this thing is not to sell the product, not to close the funding. It is to intrigue them so they want to meet with you. Then you can dazzle them with your personality, with your presentation and everything else. So one pager. Now, other thing you need to do is be investor ready. I mean, I, you can listen to me, you're not gonna remember half the things I'm telling, but there's a TED talk by this guy, it has millions of views, just listen to it. Seven, 14 minutes, it will tell you what I'm telling you, except that Gora is telling you. So recommend that. Okay, that was the first topic. How to be investor ready? Are we ready for the second topic? So this is about how you're gonna approach the investors. I'm going a little high speed, by the way, because we have a lot to cover and not enough time, so. But you'll get, if you want, I can send you the slides. You're also being recorded, so you'll have that. So being, how do you be, approach investors? The point is you need to send some way to get in front of them. You need to figure out some way to have an email which is will high probability they will contact you. you. Remember the email contact rate is very low. Unless you go through somebody they already trust, another investor, somebody they funded, some other somebody lawyer or a professor. If not, they are reluctant because they get thousands of emails, people looking for money, so they reject most of them. But you want to be ready with. A email, an executive summary, investor presentation, a financial model, and an icebreaker. If you have these five things, you're ready. So icebreaker is easy. These days, everybody has a LinkedIn. All investors do. They have, you can Google search them. Before you walk in the door, you should have a little icebreaker ready. Where they went to school. Where they grew up in Australia. They went to MIT. They played football, whatever or they tweeted about a vacation going to in Costa Rica. So that becomes your icebreaker. Use it. It's just like mentioning it. Ha, 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 I, you went to Costa Rica. Always wanted to go there. Interesting. So there's some rapport is being created. Let's talk about email. This is an email, short email. Now, you notice this is not an ordinary email. I want you to carefully look at the email. The first word in the email is, Hassan Sayyid at Aspar PK mentioned that you may be interested. So first sentence, the name of person they know. There's no way they're deleting the email or not reading because the first name is somebody they know, like, let me see. So they want to read the email now. The second sentence is what we do. In one sentence, we're reducing waste and spoilage of food using wireless sensor and AI. The third sentence is a multi-billion dollar opportunity. So without wasting any time, Ji, mera naam Abdul Khan hai. Main Sargodha mein pada hua tha. I've been going to school at NASC. Nobody cares. That's not interesting to them. So you, you have to be very precise. Every word counts. Then the next same paragraph is traction. We already have deployed two farms in Multan. We have a team of six. Then next thing is credibility. I'm a two-time CEO with a successful exit. So right there, in the first half of their iPhone, in the first thing, they have gotten enough information. traction market Then the third sentence is, I'd like to see the area of interest so I can watch you by. Then I've given all of my detailed information, phone number, name, LinkedIn profile right there. Most people send me emails with no details like this. Then I have to go. If you uh, host is not letting you speak, protest. What you don't want to be doing is unnecessarily secret.
did do we lose name? Ah, uh, yeah, we did. <clears throat> I think you might be trying to get back on. I I can't tell with my my internet sometimes if, if it's me or it's the other person. Um, but uh, just out of curiosity, can we get a sense of the audience on whether or not uh people are fundraising for the U.S. or they're fundraising for a startup in Pakistan? Like, if if in the chat we can get an idea. Oh, names back. Yeah, apparently the problem with the internet happened in Silicon Valley also. Yeah. Pakistan. Who knew? So, uh, you were saying something, Rebecca. Do you want to continue? Or? Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, out of curiosity, uh, the audience, if they are uh, building startups for the uh, the U.S. market or if they're building for the Pakistani market. I was just uh, curious. And I, if, if people could just like mention it in the chat, uh, which market they're focusing on. But didn't want to interrupt your, your flow of name. All right. Well, we don't know who they are, but no worries. Uh, you can see the slides, I hope. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so my thing is most people are unnecessarily secretive, especially in Pakistan. We ask somebody, what do you do? Oh, you know, we are working at, uh, we're working with the internet or with AI. Like, okay, everybody's working with AI. That's not news. What are you doing? Well, we, we are focused on, we're looking at internet and AI for banking. Okay, what about banking? So you start giving vague answer, which is very popular in Pakistan to give vague answer. You lose the audience. They get bored. But if you said, we're trying to reduce fraud in commercial banking transaction using AI, why can't you say that? So this is what good entrepreneurs are much more precise telling what are they doing, what problem they're solving. So don't want to be too vague. Don't want to be too secretive. Get to the point. You have one chance to get the guy's attention. So hit them hard with exactly what you do. And of course, don't be boring. Lambi, kahani, kam kam other background which is relevant to them, but look from their point of view. Uh, that, that's what people should care about. So, so let's. So other mistakes are, you know, over explaining the obvious. I don't need six slides to tell me cancer is a big market. Yeah, we know. Tell me what you're doing about it. So people waste too much time over explaining the obvious. Then of course, you know, investors need to, not, not they're not gonna buy your product. They're not gonna use your new test you have come up with. What they're buying is an opportunity to make money. So you have to be clear Third mistake people make is they map what about that company, uh, uh, you know, XYZ company, what is that company? Did you did you know that? How do you spell that? You just lost them. So before you go, Google your own solution, get the problem you're solving, because that's what investors are doing when you're talking to them. They're actually on laptop, they're typing those things, the things are coming up. And if you don't mention, don't know them, you're cooked. Other thing people, the fourth mistake people make is, ye bhi ho sakta hai, wo bhi sakta hai, wo bhi karenge. Dekho, kindi badi baat hai. We can do six things, yay. That's terrible. When Amazon started, what were they selling? One thing, books. Why, why books? Because books are easy to send, easy to return. There's no problem. Bhai, mere shakal pe chhi lag rahi. Ye pili bahut hai. There's no color issue, there's no size issue. So it was minimum moving parts. We can get that going, then other things could be added. So you need to figure out just because you can do and will do more things, what are you gonna do the, initially to get to a critical mass? So you have very, that clarity of mind will separate you from other invest, uh, entrepreneurs who are trying to impress them. So what is the structure of this investor presentation you should have? Well. It basically is, what is the unmet need and how did we discover it? That's the opportunity. Who has this problem? Who needs me more? That's called market segmentation. Then what are the alternatives today? That's your competition. What's wrong with these alternatives? That's the white space. You have identified a white space that's not being well served. 
देखें अभी हम फोर टॉपिक्स हो गए हैं आई डिड नॉट टॉक अबाउट वट वी डू मोस्ट ऑन्टरप्रनोर स्टार्ट बाई देखें जी हमने क्या कर दिया बड़ा खूबसूरत है देखें चेक दिस आउट विद सॉल्व दिस प्रॉब्लम ये नो यू स्टार्टिंग विद द प्रॉब्लम यू डिस्क्राइबिंग द ऑल्टरनेटिव हु इज द यूजर देन फाइनली नंबर फाइव इज माई सोल्यूशन then number 6 is how do we make money what do we sell that's called the business model then finally how many people have this problem what is the market size how which sliver do we start with shuru peshawar se karna ji hamara bhi ye wajah hai that's why that's a beach hai jab peshawar mein 500 log nahi milenge to hum aage kahin nahi jayenge then pricing partnerships which channel how will we make people know that's called go to market strategy then what have we done so far what are some of the milestones coming up that's the timeline then who is on board who is missing in the team then number 11 how big a company can this become and finally number 12 what do we need from you and how will we de risk the company so in the blue i'm indicating what are these topics in the fancy business terminology in black i'm telling you simply aam aadmi ke liye samajhne ke liye ki kya kya batana hai ये आपकी कहानी है ये बारह टॉपिक्स हैं आई कैन डू एनी कहानी इन फाइव टू फिफ्टीन मिनट्स इट डजेंट हैव टू बी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड इन लॉन्ग यू शुड बी एबल टू टेल द स्टोरी इन फिफ्टीन मिनट्स एंड देन रेस्ट टाइम विल बी फॉर क्यू एन ए सो आई डन दैट हंड्रेड एंड थाउजेंड ऑफ टाइम्स लेटर ऑन इफ यू हैव टाइम आई विल इवन वर्क विद यू गाइज यू कैन टेल मी वट 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 इज योर कंपनी डू एंड आई गिव यू सम फीडबैक इन रियालिटी so this is what i just covered was the first two chapters now i'm going to talk about the third chapter but let me just pause here rebecca any should we pause should we keep going do you want any questions or doesn't matter i i think we should keep going to the end and then we can ask questions but just so we're aware it looks like many in the audience uh are building for pakistan and then they plan to go abroad from there so if you can add snippets uh across your presentation that addresses this that would be amazing well that no, that's a good idea because pakistan a is a very large market and that's a very attractive market and then finally once you have unfair advantage because you know the people you know how to sell how to navigate when you get to some critical mass whether it is 1 million in sales or 5 million in sales or 10 million in sales then you can look beyond that but that's exactly the right way to do it because a lot of people push ho jate hain ke america mein aake bechenge you have you have totally at a disadvantage you don't know people you don't know the system it's very hard to succeed when you don't know all right let's talk about investor mindset so you're going through all this presentation unmet need market size solution blah 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 what is the investors hearing that's your blah 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 what they need to hear is only three things three things are is there money to be made here is this the people who can make me money and how much money will i make that's it that's the only reason they're listening to you so you need to keep that back up your mind and everything is say the question you answer should be addressing the column on the right so before you go to them you're ready with this thing you have demonstrated you have discovered a white space you have validated it through customer discovery you have it a players at least two or three or a players you have a financial model which shows that how big a company can you build and you have a compelling story and some proof people are interested so when you can check all these boxes now you're ready to talk to them now so what are the question you can ask the investors so these are some of the questions you know what is because each venture capital firm has a thesis on same building on third floor they love telecommunication 5g and whatever but on fourth floor they hate that they say stupid they're interested in consumer market so they have the, everybody has a thesis it's not their right or wrong it depends on their background how they made their money what which company they invested succeeded so ask them what is your thesis most firm have them on their website but sometimes you can ask them if they are angel investor next question is how much do you typically put in 50000 5 lakh 50 lakh everybody has a certain bite size so you want to show then you know how much time to give them how much respect to show them third thing is how much dry powder you have left because sometimes a fund is let's say 
hundred million dollar fund and there's $75 million invested. They only have two or three investments left. This means they only have, because each fund is a 10 year fund. In 10 years, they have to find companies to invest, grow them and sell them so they can return the money back to their investors. I I was caught this thing when I was not finished building the company, but their time was running out. So they forced me to sell the company. So you wanna know how much time is left. Then do you lead or follow? See the way the price round works is many people will come together once as a lead investor. Lead investor has to do all the due diligence, write the investment memo, check everything. So lead investor write the term sheet, everybody joins them. So many people will follow. They don't know how to lead. And I had a situation, I have seven people willing to put money, but I did not have a lead investor. So that's good to know who leads and who doesn't lead. And of course, you always want to ask, do you have any conflicting investments or are you looking at other companies? Because sometimes they have investment just like you, but they're just curious. They want to learn what you do. Not good. So you need to ask that up front. Okay, next topic is funding mechanics. Let's get into that. How do you exactly raise money? So typically it takes several months to raise money because you have to do your homework. You have to do, create a pitch. And then you go to one company, then they say, talk to this guy, talk to that guy. They want it, they're getting comfortable. So by the time you finish raising money, it is not uncommon. So if after pitching for two to three months, somebody is interested, then now they'll come. They want to check everything you told them. That's called due diligence. This is when, then if they're lucky, then they give you a term sheet. Term sheet is a non-binding offer to invest. If you agree and sign the term sheet, now starts the legal closing process. Now they start hiring a lawyer. Everything just you went through, now you're gonna go through with fine tooth comb. It takes another four to six weeks. Closing is when the money comes to your checking account. So this whole process is long. So there are two ways to raise money. One way is price round. This is somebody comes up with a company valuation. What is the company worth? Then that, since you know how many shares that are in the company, you can compute the price per share. That tells you when they're putting in $2 million, how many shares to issue them. So suppose they came with a price per share was company valuation is $5 million. You have 10 million shares so far issued. So the price per share will be 10 million divided by 5 million valuation divided by 10, 50 cents a share. Now they're putting in $2 million. You have 50 cents, you know, to issue them 4 million shares. That's why it would happen. But problem is coming up with a valuation is complicated. You have to know how much the company can sell for. You have to do a lot of due diligence, look at the competition. Most people, most angel investors don't have that skill. So you raise money using a note. Note is a convertible note, which means it's a loan which will convert into shares when a venture capitalist agrees, comes up with a valuation and a price per share. That could be happened two months later, six months later, one year later. So this note is very quick because there's not much to discuss. There's no valuation discussion. So this is how almost all company raise money on a convertible note or SAFE, which is a simplified version of convertible note, a Sharia compliant version of convertible note because it has no interest. It's just a promise to convert. So this is how your company looks to angel investors. They don't know what is it worth? So they cannot have that discussion. So this is why you do the note, convertible note. Nobody knows the value because it has no cash flow. You cannot apply any formulas. Convertible note is a loan. It's simply a two, three page document. You don't even need any, any legal fees. The only thing you need to negotiate is, I'm giving you money now, six months, 12 months before investor will put a price on the company. What is my benefit? I'm taking more risk. So this is the issue. Why should I put money now? What's my incentive? And short answer is you offer them a discount on the next price. When investor comes, they're paying 10 rupees per share. You will get a discount. You will Your money will convert at 8 rupees per share. So typically it's 20% discount. 
So you get more shares by giving the money early. So that's typical number, but you can negotiate that. Second problem is, what if I become too successful? Abhi aapko main million dollars de raha hu. I'm hoping to get 10% ownership in the company someday, maybe 8%. Company was so successful, they raised the money at the valuation of 50 million. So for my $1 million, I got 2%. I'm not happy. So the solution to that is you can put a cap on the valuation. If an investor wants to value at 50 million, good for them. But my valuation will not go above this number. So typically, this could be 5 million, 10 million, 8 million, whatever. So this gives protection to investors that even if company become too successful, they'll be able to get some reasonable ownership in the company. So point is that if you want to raise money on a convertible note, you read just two things to negotiate. What's the cap? What's the discount? Allah, Allah, khar salam. So if you, then Y Combinator invented something called SAVE. It stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. All the paperwork could be downloaded from this website, Y Combinator. So you can even do it yourself. Point is that it's not a debt. There's no interest being accrued. It's even simpler. So this is a quick way to, so when I talk to investors, if they like my story, say, can I, I'm raising money on a safe, can I send you the paperwork? And half the time they say, okay, sure. So you just need to make it easy on them. So the way VC fund you, they give you money, you give them shares. That's pretty simple. Only difference is the shares, the investor insists is called preferred shares. Preferred shares have special rights attached to them. We will go into them in a future thing. I don't want to waste time, but just letting you know, they, they will insist on preferred shares. Founders, unless they're putting their own money as an investor, they get common shares. Preferred shares, that's why VCs don't need to own 51% of the company to have control. They can own 20% of the company. They will have control through these other privileges which come with the preferred shares. So term sheet is a you know four to eight page PDF, bunch of clauses in there. Only the, all of them could be put into three buckets to negotiate. Economics, control, and how what will happen to you if you get fired or company gets acquired. So these are the three buckets. I do a separate class just analyzing how to negotiate a term sheet. I'm just giving you a big picture that this is in a term sheet. We can have a separate session on that. The thing is, that when this is the important part. When a VC, venture capitalist, looks at the company, they do their own analysis. Suppose they put a valuation of $3 million. They're going to invest $2 million. Question for you, what percent do they open? Do they own? What percent will they own? Uh, so, answer is 40%. Because company was valued at $3 million, that's called pre-money valuation. Then the fresh cash comes in, $2 million, the total value is $5 million. I, blue was the intellectual property and the potential. Yellow is the new fresh money. The total is $5 million. That's called post-money valuation. So Hamza asked a question, what if the VC and startup don't agree on evaluation? Then what happens? First of all, the note is not coming from VCs. Note came from the angel investors who, you know, Mame, Chache, and other people. Yeah, so the, the, this could be in the class. Yeah, the note could be paid back or you said, if it's a safe, it doesn't have to be paid back. It will convert. Or if company gets acquired, they'll get the money back times two, times three, something like that. But if VC and startup don't agree, then you go to the next one. Yeah, yeah, the one I bought the rishta wali. Aapka rishta aata hai. If you don't agree with the rishta, then what do you do? You go to the new rishta, same thing here. So it's not a big deal. If they don't agree, you find the next person when you do agree. See, nobody knows the value of the company. It's like buying a painting from an unknown artist. What is it worth? Who knows? It depends on what a willing buyer and a willing seller agree. So that's normal to negotiate like that. Anyway, so this is how it works. You start the company. These are typical numbers I'm giving you. You may buy 3 million shares bought by founders. You set aside a million shares for employee stock option pool. So you can hire different advisors and employees and give them from the yellow portion. So you have 4 million shares outstanding. 
Then a time comes, you sell some shares to investors. Series A is called because first time you give a certain price. Then you sometime later, a year or two later, you have made more progress, you need more money, you sell more shares to Series B investors. You notice founders number of shares are the same. You just keep issuing new shares from thin air. You just make more shares. So your, your percent ownership goes down, the number of shares keep going up, hopefully at a higher and higher price. So that's how you raise money. So this will give you an example. This is an example of a famous company called HubSpot. You can see on the very bottom row, they raised a seed round, half a million dollars. Then they raised a $5.6 million, amount 5.6 million at the pre-money valuation of 5.6. So this means they gave almost 50% of the company away. Then a year later, they raised 12 million at the pre-money valuation of 23 million. Then they raised 16 million at the valuation of 56. So notice that they raised money, series A, B, C, D, E, before they had an IPO. And they kept raising money at a higher and higher valuation. That's how you raise money. So what happens after the funding? So Rebecca, I'm planning to stop it in six minutes, whether I'm done or not. So just that you know. So this is a long topic. I won't cover a lot of detail because you're not there yet. But when you get there, talk to me. We'll have a separate session. Key is that you want to send some periodic updates to all the investors, maybe twice a year, but once a quarter, but definitely once a year. Twice a year is a good number. Okay, what milestone will achieve? Also, since they have invested, they're willing to help you. Ask them, I need an introduction to this company. I want to talk to somebody like that. Can you help me? Then there's, then there's a board of directors. Usually VCs will be on the board of directors along with the founders. How do you manage them? How do you tell them? Are they your boss or are they your advisors? So there's a whole discussion about that. I can go into that if somebody asks questions. Then how do you run a tight ship? So these are some of the topics we should cover about post-funding. So this is the main five topics I said we will cover. The bonus material, which is here, and we can only go to it if you want to, is realize that you go from an idea to prototype to developing the product, customers, and you raise money in chunks. Chunk is to go to the next stage, to go to the next stage. Every time you go to the next stage, your valuation goes up. So you don't have to give as much ownership to get money. Your, your source of funding is different in each stage, depending on who you're, how much money you need. You don't go to VC for $50,000. You don't go to VCs for $500 million. They're different sources of money. So just know that. What question will investor ask you? An answer is, I looked and looked and looked. There are only 28 questions. I have not found a 29th question. So if I'm going to give you this 28 question. If you already ready to answer the question before you meet them, you'll do well. This first nine, that's the second nine. We have covered most of them here, but you know, nothing should be surprising here. And these are the last 10. You notice the last few questions are in a different color because these are the trick questions. So we have to practice, how will you answer those trick questions? They're designed to be trick questions. So if somebody wants to ask me how to answer this question, I'll answer you. But obviously we don't have time to go through all 28. Maybe Rebecca will ask me some questions later. But these are the 28 questions. If you can, if you're already ready 28, then you will be not flustered. You will not be surprised, you will be comfortable. So somebody is, Get to the point where investor imagination come alive because you are the storyteller. If they can imagine this product existing, people using it, that's when they get excited. Number two, demonstrate that you have deep insights. You understand the customer. You understand the market. What do people need? Because you have talked to dozens of them. If you haven't talked to anybody, you've been sitting between, you're not going to get this clarity between your couch and your TV. You have to actually go out and talk to people. Number three is you know exactly the next few steps you need to take to de-risk the company. You're not gonna take the company all the way. Idea is to de-risk the company. Each, you raise this much money to de-risk it, then de-risk it, then de-risk it more. This is what they need to see. And finally, is if you figure out what, what will the investor want, what to do, every rule of dating applies. If you don't know, phone can you 
Why isn't she calling me back? What would you do if you were in a dating situation? Do the same thing. Is 100% relevant. I can give you many, many examples. So if you forget half the things I said, you can go to the website. I'm offering this book for free. Sign up. You'll get some advice. You'll get a free book. Up, up to you guys. So as I said to Rebecca, I'll finish in time and I am done. So now back to you. Thanks, Naeem. That was really great. Um, I, I read an amazing book on uh, fundraising called The Secrets of Sand Hill Road. And literally everything you've mentioned um, was covered in that. And I feel like you added a lot more. So I'm really excited to also go through your book as well. I will definitely be getting it. Um, I kind of want to uh, make my questions more about uh, more specific to Pakistani founders, and I'm super excited to hear what you have to say for this. Uh, so as many of you know, PESMO has uh, just raised a seed round of uh, 1.3 uh, million uh, last year when uh, barely anyone was getting uh, funded. It was a very tough time. This was happening during the May 9th protests. And um, as we all know, Pakistan is still going through a lot of uh, political change. So for what I learned as a, uh, a native Californian uh, raising for Pakistan is that you don't just raise for your business model, but you also raise for Pakistan, right? So um, my question, my first question for you, Name, is how do you, how can you best prepare a Pakistani founder, especially those who are looking to fundraise for the Pakistani market and beyond to be successful when they're speaking to foreign or international investors? The short answer is, what do investors, international investors, what do they care about? They care about three things. Number one, is there money to be made? And Pakistan market is a huge market you know, 220 million people, most of them are using internet. Of course, most of them use it for the wrong reason, but they have access to internet. And the market is big and there's not a lot of foreign companies selling. So it's a great juicy market. Number two, are these people trustworthy? Are they honest, committed, motivated? And so this will come through how you present yourself, how you answer the question, how serious you are. So that's the second thing. Uh, and the third opportunity is that, do they have hallucination or have they have any traction? So if you can just do those three things that Pakistan, give them statistics that Pakistan is a good market, how many uh, untapped market. This is what China was in 2002. This is what India was in, you know, I don't know, 2016, 15. So give them that and be credible and show that we have not just thought about it, we have taken some steps, it's credible. So if you can just focus on these three things, you become attractive to people. It's not about you're from Pakistan or Uganda. I um, I especially really like how you talked about two main things. You talked about setting up your story correctly. So doing a lot of research on setting up the story. The second part was researching your investor, figuring out who to pitch to, uh, figuring out what their thesis is, are they willing to invest in a Pakistani startup? And what's great about um, Pack Launch is that uh, Pack Launch has done a lot of the homework for many Pakistani founders in the sense that uh, all of the investors who are interested in investing in Pakistan are literally going to be in Riyadh because that that's literally the the point of the event. So that that's an, an amazing thing that has been done. Uh, so, but. Uh, my 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 question would be: As you're sort of fundraising, how do you determine, as a founder, uh, how do you determine the difference between a bad valuation and a good valuation in terms of like the the founder investor fit as well? Because in 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 my experience, valuation for a Pakistani startup is based on the current market forces. Obviously, in 2021, the benchmarks were a bit higher, whereas now in 2024, they're a bit lower. So how can, like, what are some sort of benchmarks that you can tell a founder to help, like, navigate uh, overselling your company too much in the beginning in order to be able to start versus uh, figuring out, you know, what are good terms? Short answer is... That's the wrong question. If you're 
Let, let me explain why. Not wrong question coming out of Rebecca's mouth. Wrong question, but uh, entrepreneurs are thinking. Valuation is important, but that's not the biggest thing. If you, you one investor is willing to invest in you with, let's say, valuation of $2 million, you really think this is bakwas, it should be $5 million. Yes, I want you to look for other investors. You need to give argument of fairness. You need to give argument of other arguments. And one of the argument is, look, if you take most of my company, what will be our incentive? How will we uh, get other people? We want your head in the game. So typical is that you will give up for the very first round about 20 to 25% of the company, a series seed. And by series A, you'll give up maybe 40 to 45% of the company. By series B, probably 70%. This is normal because valuation is going up of the overall shares. So this is how we, you should think about that. But my point I was making was uh, that if you stuck on valuation and your alternative is no money and go out of business, I will rather take some valuation, any valuation, so I can create value. Look at HubSpot. They raise $5 million at $5 million valuation. They gave 50% of the company. But were they disheartened, dis discouraged, went to hell? No. They kept, they took the company public all the way. But all the way public, they were able to make the company worth $760 million. Today, it's over a billion dollars. So point is, don't get stuck on valuation. Look at the character and the history of the investor. Are they helpful? Are they annoying? Do they have the build company? Can they be useful to you? Chodi Mari Farak in evaluation, don't get stuck on that. Look at the big picture. They want to offer you 4 million valuation, you want 6 million. That's not good. Only time I will be resistant if it's so egregious that I'll, I'm giving up like 50% of the company in the very first step. That's not fair. I was involved more in Pakistan BC scene. They wanted 80% ownership in the company for the first initial money. That was murderous. That was stupid. And that didn't work. Those things died. Okay. Um, another part is um, so you invest you mentioned that uh, looking for an investor is, is like dating, right? You're essentially dating to get married. And in that marriage, you have like monthly meetings of like, you know, how is the relationship doing? What for you are kind of like pieces of advice where you have found founder investor fit? And after this question, I would like to open it to the floor so if everyone can start typing in their questions while name answers this, this would be great. So, so let, uh, let me hear the quick question that I got distracted by somebody uploading a presentation uh, called Investor Ready, and which is not this presentation because I just, I made it this morning. So whatever somebody posted is the wrong presentation. I'll post this presentation to Ali. So that that is my presentation. It has some useful, but it's not this presentation. So do you mind uh, repeating the question, uh, Rebecca? Oh, yeah. Sure. So um, my question is uh, for markets like emerging markets like Pakistan, I feel like the importance of founder investor fit is even more important right because uh like like in my case for example a a pakistani vc understands the market forces of pakistan more than usually more than a international vc so my question is how do you know you have found founder investor fit and like what do you think are the benchmarks for that so the short answer is you will never know it's like do you how do you know this is the right guy to marry you know, you, it looks appropriate, but we know it is not always the case. So the question you could ask is, why are they interested in this market? What is the criteria? Have they invested in outside their home place and have it? How was that experience, good or bad? So by asking some question, you're trying to understand, do they appreciate it or are they being fooled or will they have an unnecessary expectation? If the things are going further, you can also ask them, I want to talk to some other CEOs you were invested in. I always do that. I do my own due diligence on the investor because not all investors are supportive or have time for you or could be generally annoying or have short patience for outcome. Because Pakistani market, although it's very juicy, is also complicated because of politics, because of a whole bunch of complications of currency and whatnot. So somebody has to know that they're taking a currency risk, they're taking a political risk, 
is it, I have to thought about it, is it worthy because the economic upside is significant, but you have to balance against those other risks. So by asking those questions, you know, again, go back to the dating analogy, how do you know it's the right person? By spending more time understanding what's really, what they're really thinking, that, that that's when you know. Okay. Now I'm going to switch it a bit more from the audience. Uh, we have uh, the first question that Ali Fahad asked, I believe you have already answered about um, the VC and the founder not agreeing on valuation. So I'm going to skip that one. The next question is uh, by Imad Memon. Uh, so how do you create a story for a product which does not fall in your main area of expertise? Ooh. The thing is by, by saying that convincing people that look, if there's an opportunity and we know exactly who needs it, the story is compelling. Once I get your money, I will hire people. This is the list of five people who do have core expertise. And of course, to make sure that you're not hallucinating, you have met with people who need this product and they say, ha, agar ye hota to main lunga hai. So you have confirmed your assumption. You can speak not vaguely, but specifically. Rebecca, how is your Urdu? Um, it's, it's, it's okay. It could be better. <laughs> the point is that you need to tell the story with specific actual people names so it's believable. And it has to be a real story. So short answer is you can. I mean, Steve Jobs was not a computer designer. He was able to recruit Steve Wozniak, who was. So this is not unusual. People, once you have the money, you can get the expertise, but the story has to be validated for potential customers and users. And you can tell the story, then you're fundable. One question somebody asked was about ed tech companies. If, if there's so much opportunity in education, why don't somebody get funded? Point, answer is simple. The buyer has no money. So yes, there's a huge need, but no school has money to spend on anything. No universities can do that except in a Chinese speaking country. Hong Kong, Singapore, yes, different story. But America, completely impossible to sell to ed tech market. Pakistan, I think Pakistan, there's opportunity because a lot of rich people, they wanna spend money on education. They don't know where to go. So Pakistan, there is a better, better chance of ed tech companies getting uh, traction, but yeah. And a lot of stuff is available for free, like Salman Khan, Khan Academy and stuff. Uh, we have another question from Danish Lakani. So his question is, uh, what if during the course of building the startup, uh, the board and the founders disagree on the direction of the startup? How do you move forward and how do you deal or prevent with that situation? Oh. You know, just like any relationship, when you don't agree on a strategy, how do you resolve that problem? It's the same discussion. There is no one solution. Solution is you bring data on the table, why you believe we should go left, and you want to hear other people why they should go right. Once you understand the underlying reasoning, almost always you can come to something which will work for both parties. Sometimes you cannot agree because you really want to go left and board who represent the shareholders want to go left. And that time, they only have one handle they can pull. The handle is to remove the CEO. And that's why when I say they have control, one of the control clauses when you issue preferred shares is exactly that. They will have that control. That can happen, does happen. But normally, both parties, especially the other party, you see, you started the company, you have like four reasons to start the company. You want to make some money. You want to change the world. You want to be famous and be recognized for so. You have a chip on your shoulder. You want to prove to your father you're better than him. And they're all good reasons. All four of them are good reasons. Investors only have one reason, to make more money. They don't care about your father. They don't care about you being famous. So when, as long as your agreement, you can demonstrate this makes money, it'll be unlikely that they will be disagreeing. But if there is disagreement, it's not the board who's getting fired, it's the CEO who's getting fired. That's why in the term sheet, the founder treatment is an important section. I mentioned that. So you wanna spell that out. What happens if you terminate the investor for cause, without cause, post-acquisition, pre-acquisition, there are a bunch of, Scenarios have to be covered 
that's how you protect yourself. And I think uh, people are really excited for the bonus questions. I think you mentioned questions 24 to 28. Uh, one of them is, um, would you be will like, how do you navigate answering the question? Would you be willing to step down as CEO? Yeah. So this is a trick question because I want to see, are you driven by ego? This is my company. Of course, I started it. In Pakistan, I want to pass it to my son and my daughter. That's the wrong question. The correct way to answer is, look, right now, there's nobody knows more about this problem, this need, because I'm personally vested in this. I want to take the company to the point when I can demonstrate, but a point will come if you're successful, I would have outlived my usefulness or I will be somebody more capable to scale the company. I'll be the first one to start looking for that person because I'm not just a CEO, I'm a shareholder. I want to make sure we succeed. So some answer like that tells them that you're not just driven by your ego, you're thinking what's best for the company. And if you have to become chief strategy officer or chairman of the board and have somebody else, this is you're not against it fundamentally. So they want to see that flexibility and your reasoning. That's how you answer that question. And to close things up, as we're now at the last minute, and I like being on time, uh, my uh, my question, my last question is uh, part of the um, last twenty nine, sorry, twenty eight questions, is uh, how do you navigate? And and I really feel like this really formed my my uh, round. How do you navigate the questions? Who else are you talking to? And how are you valuing your company or what's the valuation? So these are both strict questions. So again, go back to dating analogy. If somebody says, we are talking about that's not the question you want to answer. Is it Yasmin or is it Rukhsana or is it Lisa? Because they all will collude and you have no leverage. You always want to say something about, of course, we're talking to all the right players. And we are... Uh, we're in you know early stage or late stage of discussion, and as soon as we you know we get very very close, I'll I'll give you a heads up. But you do not want to mention the name of other people you're talking to. Once you sign the term sheet, then it's a different story. Then said we already have a term sheet signed with this investor. Now you go to people; those meetings will be much faster, much quicker, and because once you once you have the term sheet, so be very careful. Some people, a lot of people, get excited to start saying this, name dropping. Terrible idea. You will lose all leverage. Number two, how do you value the company? Uh, is that what you said? Or, uh, or <laughs> no, how do you value uh, your company? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, That's no, a no. trick question. Um, See, this but, is like... Go ahead. but also the question, when the investor directly asks you, yeah, yeah. what's the value? See, think of this way. You are trying to buy a carpet in a carpet shop. There's no written price on it. How will it be smart for you to say to the to the dukandar, this is my this is this is not that good. Eight lakh. The guy was gonna give it to you for tisadar. But you mentioned eight lakh and by rope I've made that mistake myself a few times. Don't do that. Your point answer should be: look, I'm good at building the companies. I'm not good at valuing the company. That's your job. Please give me something which is fair and reasonable, and let's do business. That's your answer. And whatever number they come up with, you pretend to be disappointed and annoyed and say, come on. That's, a, that's normal negotiation. But you never put it, the moment you put a number on it, it's a wrong number. If you put too low, then you just gave up the too much of the company. If you put it too high, they say, you know, we don't have time to Negotiate the guy's expectations are way out of control. We'll just wait for the next bus. Goodbye. So any number you can say will work against you. Do not say a number. Resist the temptation. They'll ask you multiple times. Your answer is always, you are good at coming up with values in the company. I don't know. I know how to build products. I can talk about it. So you got to deflect. This has been a very interesting name. Do you have any sort of uh, last words to like round up what you want everyone to take away from this? Yeah, take away. I don't know if I any last profound work more than I have said already, but most people are too full of themselves. And it's all about, look at me, me so pretty. Like I have this company. 
Don't give a shit about you. The only thing they're trying to buy, is there an opportunity of somebody who has figured out how to make money, which I, I'm willing to participate. So be humble, be confident, be informative. Guess what you're not doing when you're talking? Listening. Because if you listen, you'll pick up many, many clues, what motivates them, why they wanna invest in you. If you take notes, after every investor meeting, sit down for 10 minutes, write down everything you observed, what he said, because after six, seven meetings, you won't remember who said what. So I hope good luck in fundraising activity next month, but I'm here to help and answer the question. Ali knows how to get hold of me. Thank you, Naeem. This was amazing. I hope Ali Fahad considers bringing you again for maybe figuring out how to uh, word things during the negotiation table. Yeah, we can well, do um, One thing I just want to add was so Naeem Zafar, he also teaches a mini MBA program at UC Berkeley, and it's a uh, very, very low cost or free. Um, I think you can share more, but I think you can sign up and we're also discussing maybe doing some parts of that training um, and doing some webinars around it here. So so he has a much longer program, but hopefully over the summer, we'll request names up to do those for this group. I, I think uh, <clears throat> a lot of people couldn't join the video and stuff. Names up, there's a, there's a lot of internet issues going on in Pakistan right now. So... Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And this time, mini MBA is a six week program, 12 session, half recorded, half live. I just put something in the chat. You can Google Thai mini MBA, so open for Thai Milke offer Karan, taught by two instructors. It starts in 28th of February. So consider registering for that. And uh, we're trying to create special pricing for Park Angel. So that's check that out as well. And I'll I'll put the PDF of this presentation uh, to Ali's uh, WhatsApp in the next three minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, both. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank you day. Take care. Thanks all. Bye bye.